hosting this effort to think about what it means to think about health as a human right. Our speakers throughout this year have been getting us thinking about what it means what ethical what the ethical implications of a right to health consist of as well as thinking about not only equal access to adequate health care but public health the effect of for example poverty on health and getting us thinking about the causes of health disparities both nationally and internationally um, as I mentioned, this is part of a larger lecture series. And for all of you here today, I hope you will also join us on our next lecture on February 27th, when Sophia Gruskin will be speaking on health and human rights, no longer a question, moving from concepts to action. I always start these lectures with a very long list of thanks. Um, and I think that it's important to recognize the fact that so many people have seen this as an important lecture series that the list of sponsors and co-sponsors is very long so if you'll bear with me the health as a human right lecture series is being made possible in part by support from richard and ronnie lippin the author w page center for integrity and public communication the center for Healthcare and policy research the center for human development and family research in diverse contexts Children, Youth, and Families Consortia, the Department of Biobehavioral Health, the Department of Health Policy and Administration, the Department of Sociology, the Gerontology Center, the Penn State College of Medicine's Department of Humanities, the Penn State Pre-Medicine Program, and the School of Nursing, as well as the University Libraries. The Rock Ethics Institute events are also made possible with the support of a generous gift from Doug and Julie Rock. Today, I'd like to ask Anne Buchanan to introduce our speaker. It's a pleasure to introduce Richard Garfield today. He's an old friend, and when I first met him more than 30 years ago, he was organizing a drive to collect medical supplies for people living in conflict-ridden areas in Africa. Since then, he's become a nurse, earned three degrees in public health, including a doctorate from Columbia University School of Public Health, where he concentrated in international health, epidemiology, and social and behavioral aspects of disease control. He currently is Henrik H. H. Ben Dixon Professor of Clinical International Nursing at the School of Nursing at Columbia, and Director of the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, Collaborating Center in Advanced Practice Nursing. He consults for numerous NGOs, governments and governmental agencies around the world on nursing practice and health issues related to poverty and conflict. He may have more degrees and publications now than he did when I met him 30 years ago, but he's still doing the same important work. Please join me in welcoming Richard Garfield. Hi. Um, I do have more degrees because I didn't have any degrees 30 years ago. And I do have more publications because I didn't have any publications. And I had forgotten that um, I was collecting supplies. This is, you have to be careful what you do because somebody you know 30 years later will remind you of these things. Um, I mainly work in countries with conflicts. This is after I got my public health degree, I ended up going to Latin America and worked in malaria control for a decade in areas where control was being made more difficult because of conflict and went on to work in other countries in the world uh, where there either are military conflicts or economic sanctions, mainly working with ministries of health in those countries to uh, strengthen the service system in times of crisis when demand goes up and when resources go down. In terms of rights, the big picture uh, issue is that we usually actually can improve health when resources are down and when crises go up because changing what we do and making sure that what we're doing responds to the condition of the country makes many of the program activities much more effective. Uh, I, I'm sort of alone in what I do because it's usually working in countries where nobody would want to go to or pariah countries where you're, you're not supposed to go. And the people who are there responsible for making things work usually are quite isolated. Uh, 
So giving them a little bit of help to find out what's going on and figuring out uh, what, what is working and what we can make work better makes an enormous difference in quality of life for millions of people who are in these areas of the world. That's how come I ended up doing this kind of work because I saw that it was easy, uh, useful, and there were hardly any people around doing it. Now there are a few. There are about a dozen of us around the world who do this. Uh, what I do is what you would call mainly epidemiological work. Uh, this is the area of public health where we count everything like crazy and then figure out what's higher and what's lower and how the rates compare from one place to another so we can try to figure out what's driving those differences and those rates and those changes. It's actually pretty simple, but you've got to keep at it to get it right. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about yourselves to get some sense of um, what I can tell you that's particularly useful. Um, could a couple people volunteer to tell me what you would like to be doing five years from now? Not that you have to have it all figured out, but just some idea. If you got some image or some idea. Research like what? Very good. Some other ideas? Who can't hear me? Oh, sorry. Um, scientific research on bi uh, uh, behavior and something about physiology, perhaps imaging and its relation to it. Uh, I'm asking because I'm mainly not in the United States, and I haven't been in Pennsylvania in many years, so um, I wonder what it's like for you. Uh, and what you're thinking about. Could it, two other people give me some, some idea? There's no right answer to this question. You've got to speak up even for me to hear. Uh -huh. uh, pediatric physical therapy. Are many of you interested in the health sciences? Are any of you interested in ethics? I actually avoid the concept of ethics to a large extent because, uh, again, from the point of view of epidemiology of counting things, uh, we, we tend to th see things clearer in terms of counts. How many people are dying from what? How many people have what? What is our potential to modify that situation? Um, Ethics all comes into it, uh, but usually what happens in any country, including our own, is that decisions are made more on a political basis than on an epidemiological basis. So we want to get the, the data clear first so that people can then discuss whose illnesses or conditions are more important or where the, the greater uh, and lesser bang is to be gotten. Um, you'll find as you get into the world of doing things that very often uh, the important decisions are made on a very thin basis of information uh, and providing better quality baseline. Simple stuff can make an enormous difference on how people face problems. Um, so I, I would say that's the, the, the real ethical core of what I do. The other reason I try not to think about ethics too much is that when you're in the middle of situations where people um, have a lot of misery, you can just make yourself crazy. Um, in every country I work in, I would say, um, some of the people are trying to respond to humanitarian emergencies, and some of the people are trying to make a buck off it. Um, and the latter usually do a better job, because they are clear-headed about what their objectives are. Um, and you can, you can really, you can make yourself ineffective if you get too, too wrapped up in, in the ethics. But it's behind all the stuff, as you're going to see. Let me just ask for one other person to give me some idea of what you might imagine yourself doing in the future. Postdoc or tenure track? Okay, you told me about a a way to do things, but not what to do. Autoimmune stress. Good. So a lot of you are 
uh, interested in scientific, current scientific developments, I get the sense what's happening today and where research can be going in the future. I guess, uh, I'm just guessing, that many of you are thinking about um, careers in the United States. How many of you are thinking of continuing to live for a long time in Pennsylvania? How many of you would like to get out of Pennsylvania? But most of you who want to get out of Pennsylvania, I'm going to guess you don't want to go that far. Is that right? I came from a small town in upstate New York, and I want to get far. Um, I was thinking before I went to any school that I would train and I would go to work in Africa. And then I took a wrong turn, and I ended up in Latin America for a decade. Um, and I ended up working in Africa, but I had no idea that I would. See, here, here's another clue. This is, again, not what I'm supposed to talk about today, but this is what you need to know. Find an area where nobody's working and get going on it, and then three or four years down the line, when people say, who's the expert in Syria, they're going to come to you, even though you're not. But you are the closest thing. So I'm considered uh, one of the experts in the world in this stuff because nobody was doing it, and I started doing it. Um, so then you get to stand up in front of people and be the expert, which I'm glad Anne didn't mention that. Since she knows me from before your age, she can do that. It's really terrible when you get up and then people are going to say, here's the world expert in such and such. But pick something that everybody else isn't doing. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about, I think, things that you haven't thought about and haven't seen. These are things you don't normally see in the newspaper uh, or in, in the press. Um, and I'm going to try to give you sort of a big view about conflict, violence, um, and the opportunities that we are sometimes successful in, in changing quality of life for lots of people. So these are, I'm going to start with some big strokes and then get down to some uh, specifics. This is a virtually uninterpretable figure, uh, but I'm going to walk you through it some. This is the number of millions of people per year killed in wars in the 20th century, and the major wars with some symbolic uh, uh, idea there, so you can have a clue of where they are. You see that the, the majority of people who died in wars in the 20th century died in World War I or World War II. That's why they have those special names. They really do deserve them. You also see that when there is one war, there are often many wars, and that's particularly true around World War II, that there were wars that led up to, wars that went along with at the same time, and then wars that followed World War II. Uh, what was uh, the end of the war for the United States was not the end of World War II for some countries that were still engaged in related or regional conflicts. Then you see that the number of deaths by year went down a great deal, but that the number of conflicts went up. It became impossible to represent them because there were many more small conflicts. This is, um, this is about where the end of the Cold War happened. And the nature of violence in the world since the end of the Cold War is very different because of changing patterns. Um, you would think that there would be a good deal of analysis of this, because whenever you get 50 or 100 million people dying, that's something worth uh, counting. Notice that only in a few years were there less than a million people in a given year dying in wars. But there's been virtually no analysis of the kind of work that we do in epidemiology and that some of you have mentioned you're interested in doing in health areas, despite the massive number of deaths. These are what you would call uh, extra system deaths, because almost all the deaths that we analyze in health systems have to do with the deaths that occur to our polity within our political, economic, and social system. When we are causing deaths outside of that system or another system's causing deaths in our system, those don't enter into the counts. Uh, it turns out that when you do count violent deaths in the 20th century, they accounted for an enormous proportion of all deaths. Uh, but we tend not to count them. And there's actually only about 200 people who work on counting these kind of things. And almost all of them are in military services. What they're doing is counting deaths and the avoidance of deaths in their polity, which is soldiers. What that means is that if you get multiple national systems, analyzing only those deaths to their interest group, who's left out entirely of this, 
is civilians of, uh, outside of your uh, political grouping or ethnic grouping or national borders. That's where there has been the least analysis. And because I was working in malaria control in Latin America, I saw and I started to have to deal with a lot of civilian casualties, and that's how I got interested in this. You see here on the left uh, summary data going a little bit even bigger than that last figure that I showed you. If you try to do an accounting, which is incomplete, but nonetheless quite useful, uh, in the real world, almost all data is incomplete, and it still can be quite useful. By century, the number of military deaths per year went up a great deal in even when you control for the increase in population of the world by century, essentially we have a tenfold increase in deaths to soldiers in the 20th century. It's by far and by any measure the bloodiest time in all human history as a proportion of populations of the world, both because more people were in military service in the 20th century and military activity went on continuously, whereas in other centuries it generally hasn't, and concentrations of soldiers in much larger groups occurred. So there were more people exposed to risk as soldiers, and there was much more killing power concentrated in the 20th century, resulting in, roughly speaking, a, a tenfold increase in the proportion of the population of the world that was dying um, as soldiers. We analyze uh, deaths to soldiers partly because that's really the only good data we have. And we hope that this also gives us some impression, but sometimes does not. It's only in the last five years, that, uh, last eight years, that we've gotten any level of quality expertise and numbers for doing analysis of deaths among civilians. If you think back to that first figure where you get lots of little wars at the end over here, this is that period. This is uh, uh, end of World War II into the future. What you have is, this is the total number of wars that are going on in the world, and the number went up a great deal. These are all little wars, not all, but mostly little wars, because the total number of deaths was going down. And you have a very important change, which continued to change after the end of the Cold War, is that not only were there more little wars, but almost all of them occurred within countries rather than between countries. We haven't seen that pattern of warfare as the dominant force of death among soldiers since 300 years before. It has been essentially the modern era has been uh, the time of uh, organized political violence by nation states toward other nation states rather than subnational groups. This is part of the reason why concern for civilian deaths has grown uh, con more concern rather than effective action for the most part. Uh, because when you have conflicts between informal groupings within countries, it's much less clear when you have combatants or when you have non-combatants and the potential for influencing the effect, uh, life of non-combatants goes up exponentially. In other words, you have a much more potential for civilians to be affected by wars. This one picks up at the very end of the last one. And this is the period where we're actually doing better counting. This is that, that, that little stuff at the end of the first one I showed you, if you expand it up. Um, remember that first one, most, most years were above a million. Now we're below 160,000 per year. And since the late 90s going down, the last three years have each had less than 100,000 soldiers dying in wars. It's actually been the least bloodiest period in more than 120 years. So at some level, um, things are changing. We, we don't, you wouldn't know this because it is the horrific deaths that reach the front page of a newspaper. But actually, there are far fewer deaths from organized violence at a national level or by uh, sub-national organized political groupings than there's been at any time since we started doing good counting of this stuff after the Civil War. Um, and what I've got it down, the, 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 these scales are human development levels. 
Has anybody heard of the Human Development Index? I'd be surprised if anybody did. Uh, we have a difficult time figuring out how to characterize level of development of countries. The easiest way to do it is by gross national product per person. But that doesn't characterize well enough how developed a country is. And what the UN has done over 15 years is evolved this index which combines life expectancy, literacy, and uh, gross national product per person. If you put them all together, number one is the high development countries, high index development countries, and five are the least development. Well, actually, there's no deaths here in, in that first group. Deaths in wars today, essentially, is entirely a function of poor countries, which is part of the change of pattern, moving conflicts moving internal to countries. But even there, uh, you see 2001 and the year since, um, we've, we've had, uh, of course, it's bopping around some. You can't have a, a completely stable level of this kind of a thing. But compared to these other years, we have a remarkable change in pattern. That's deaths, and that's deaths to soldiers. But if you look at other effects besides deaths, or if you look at non-combatants, it's a pretty different picture. Here, using the same level from high human development to low human development index countries, if, if you look at these years where the number of deaths and conflicts going down, what's happened at the same time is that the number of people displaced by conflicts has gone up a great deal. These are people we used to call refugees. But in fact, there are few refugees in the world today. Refugeehood was largely a product of the Cold War because when people wanted to get out of harm's way from their country, if they were in one of the Cold War blocks, they were accepted very often in the other block. When the Cold War ended, countries stopped being willing to take in refugees. So most of the people who are displaced today are displaced within their borders. Um, if we look just at the number of refugees, the number is going down. But also, the duration of refugeehood, essentially, uh, if you're a refugee today, almost all refugees today were refugees 15 years ago. There are no new refugees being accepted or admitted in countries. There are some exceptions. The United States does take, I think, somewhere between uh, 30 and 50,000 refugees in from other countries. But that's, that's a pretty small blip um, in the world scale. Most people who are displaced are displaced within countries. And what we've learned is that your chance, uh, your life chances in all aspects, but specifically of dying, go way up if you're a displaced person. All of the normal things that you depend on, sanitary engineering, uh, social bonds, uh, education systems, child support, uh, generating and uh, uh, storing food, all of these systems break down when you're displaced and you're exposed to all kinds of risks. Essentially, what we have is a 15 to 20-fold chance of dying, N not if you're around where they're fighting, but if you're displaced from an area where there is fighting to another area. So we got fewer people dying from bullet holes in their bodies in wars, but a lot of people moved out of the way. We actually have more people displaced in the world today as a proportion of the population of the world than at any time in the last 100 years. The last time we had such high displacement was around 1900, uh, which is when, I guess, the last biggest uh, movement of, of displaced people to the United States, where we were receiving a million or a million and a half a year for a decade. Uh, we're, we're at that level again. But these are people, essentially, who are staying within the regions because they can't get out. And with the number of deaths of war going down, there's this one other thing going up. Again, it's Human Development Index, but I broke it into three groups instead of five groups for this. We're having more disasters. These are not military conflicts. These are uh, largely ecological and environmental effects. And I, I used to have to explain what this meant. But after the tsunami in Asia last year, a little over a year ago now, and Katrina this last summer, you know what this, what this stuff is. I don't have to explain too much. There are more disasters occurring in the world. We used to call these things natural disasters. But 
for the most part, what would have been a small natural disaster 40 or 50 years ago is a situation like Katrina today, where you get higher concentrations of people living in areas where people didn't used to live before because they weren't ecologically sound areas to live, like living along coasts or living in marginal hilly areas. Um, and transforming that environment, which is not Katrina, but is the characteristic of uh, most disasters in developing countries. So a situation which might have caused a few deaths, like landslides or floods, causes much greater flooding and much more effects in death and displacement to much larger populations. Last year, uh, there was a flood, I think it was in Delhi, India. Um, and the Indians were all amazed because uh, they're used to monsoon rains, which cause light levels of flooding. But in the last five years, in this area of the city, Delhi, and the tributaries of the rivers that were going into this area, they had gone from farmland and forest to wall-to-wall -to -wall huts. So there was no place to absorb water. And so there were many more people exposed to it, and about a thousand people died. It was like a flash flood that they thought was a little thing, and suddenly the effects were much greater than they had been in the past. We're seeing more and more disasters, which are a combination of natural events and human re-engineering of their environments. This would be a good area of science to go into, because we're going to see these things continue to go up. Of course, global warming is a factor, but, but there's a lot of other things going on. And what you, you can see that here because it's the middle income developing countries where most of the increase in disasters is occurring. The really poor countries, people are still in rural areas and dispersed. They haven't had the ability to re-engineer their environment enough to cause disasters. The developed countries have sanitary engineering, investments in protection, which, don't, which, which tend to prevent disasters. And it's largely the middle income countries where human populations are concentrating very rapidly and changing their environment in ways that make it much more risky for them to live. So we're going to keep having more disasters as a cause of displacement and human misery, even though uh, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this sort of like this counterpoint, because on the one hand, the world is doing really good in terms of reducing the numbers of people who are dying in wars, uh, but uh, injury deaths overall and the risk of uh, interrupting lives and, and increased vulnerability is occurring through other mechanisms that we're starting to get a handle on. So I guess I could say the best, the best thing about this is it used to take us about 100 years to figure out how many people had died in mass events. And now we can tell within a year or two where we're doing well and where we're doing poorly. Our ability to monitor stuff is getting better. If you take all injury deaths from all sources combined, you find that war is actually the smallest of them. And both in developing, no, developing and developed countries, motor, ve motor vehicular deaths are the number one cause of injury death in the world. So the part that I am working on is actually the smallest of the four sections. But the reason I work on it, partly like I was saying, is that nobody's doing it. But also, it's very often the area where we can do the best job at protection most easily, partly because we have done so little of it, where you do start to try to protect civilian populations from the risks related to conflict or disasters. You can reduce mortality rates very often, very rapidly. This is a map of the world which shows where the conflicts since the end of World War II have been. And there's one other thing superimposed here. There's a good thing about maps is you can look at different things in space. Are the lower income countries. You see that since the end of World War II, conflicts are concentrated in, along the borders of the areas of the poorest countries of the world. And increasingly, with the decrease 
for, of total conflicts in recent years, more and more of the conflicts that do exist are in Africa. That's what that heavy black line is. Let me stop for a minute here. Have I... Is, can you absorb this? It makes some sense. Is it depressing? Is it interesting? Tell me that what I dedicate my life to is interesting. <laughs> That's somebody who's doing well. Who said that? OK. I have a question, though. And maybe you're going to get into this, so it's not in the slide. But is there something that has happened within the last 10 years that the great number of wars has decreased? Like, are we seeing kind of countries that were kind of fighting after the Cold War sort of get on their feet and get guns? Although there's only a few people who are actually counting the deaths, there are lots of people in the field of political science and sociology who try to analyze to answer those questions. Many more people are trying to come up with the great aha than actually figure out what's going on. Um, I would call that an ethical dilemma because they're using really bad data to come up with interesting but useless theories. Um, but what I can tell you is we, we've had several waves. Uh, first of all, at the end of World War II, the first big wave were the wars of decolonialization, where countries gained independence from former colonial empires. Second wave was wars on those borders between them, very often which became proxy wars between the uh, Western Bloc or the Eastern Bloc in the Cold War. With the end of the Cold War, the peace dividend gave us a new round of wars which had been the suppressed wars within and between countries that were in parts of those empires. Um, the, the suppressive power of the troops of one or the other bloc disappeared and Pandora's box was opened. Um, and what we've had more recently, since most of those wars have worked themselves out or petered out, is a strange kind of war internal to countries that we're not sure what to call them. But the best name, there's two ways to call them. One is identity wars and resource wars. In other words, these are not wars to try to take over a government and uh, impose an ideology and go in a national direction, like we thought that's what wars were for. Some of these are wars just to grab uh, a 50 mile area where there's a lot of wealth in the ground, some mice. This is the problem of Congo, is that Congo has lots of potential riches and lots of potential warlords who uh, find an investor in developed countries for the most part to arm 50 guys, start a war, call it something so you can sound like you had a reason, and then just uh, rape the earth, make the money and get out. Um, and where we find the most complicated and tractable situations is the combination of identities, religious or ethnic, and potential resources. Um, you could call them investment wars, uh, making money. This is what's been happening in all of West Africa, where we have repeated bouts over 20 years of about 10 different wars, which now seems to be finished in Liberia, but is popping up next door in uh, uh, Ivory Coast and was going on in Sierra Leone next door, but suppressed by British, a British invasion to stabilize the country. This is sort of like going back to colonial power, uh, not with colonial interest, but uh, with historical relationships. Um, Liberia seems to be coming out of it, but it's really hard to know. When, when you have uh, identities that you can whip up to get people going, while somebody else is uh, busy with their hand in your pocket. Those things are very hard to stop unless you have a strong uh, central government polity, which many of these countries don't have, and or a stable, a stable administration, an army, which is well formed and stable to control and suppress it. Haiti's in the middle of the situation as well, where it sort of dips in, goes out, dips back in, uh, because somebody's making a buck. And somebody else may sincerely believe that their group is oppressed and should be dominating the other group. But this is sort of like the Hatfields and McCoy, and that'll just go on forever. Um, 
I guess you could add that those wars, the, the continuation of those situations depend on the major powers thinking that it's not in their strategic interest to directly intervene, because that's the quickest and easiest way to end them. Uh, the Clinton administration delicately got involved in several and got their uh, comeuppance in some of them and sort of pulled back. And the uh, Bush candidacy in the year 2000 was that we're not the world's policemen, we're not going to get involved in this sort of thing. And then mm, things happen. Um, and we are actually in charge of the, uh, we, we are the motive force for the only historically uh, common style of uh, one army representing one government invading another country. Uh, there are several in Eurasia, but those are small and, and unstable. But this one is, is the real thing. Except that for the war in Iraq, you have to say there are several things that are historically completely unique about it. It's the first war in history where we don't know who the enemy is. Um, there isn't actually a name for them. We don't know what their structure is. And, and actually, it's, it's three or four different enemy groupings. But they themselves don't know how to describe themselves or, or what the political program is that they are fighting for. Um, that makes it really hard to fight. Uh, the war in Vietnam was a difficult war to fight because you couldn't identify the enemy. But you know there was a political and military structure behind it and a political program, ultimately a Politburo, which made decisions. There was a structure you could identify and finally sit down at a negotiating table. We, we actually still don't have a name for the insurgents in Iraq three years into a war. It's never been that situation. Um, so this slide is talking about some of these small wars and our attempts to figure out, first of all, the most basic of questions, how many people died? Uh, these are not all, but these are many of the major small wars, sort of a contradiction in terms, in the last 30 years or so. So of these, the ones in red are the only ones for which we had any field-based studies to, to make an estimate of how many people had died. The others are based entirely on press reports, meaning somebody scratched their head and said, I don't know, maybe uh, like 100,000, maybe 200,000? And somebody else wrote it down. And then other people wrote it down because they had seen it written down, and pretty soon it became true. But we don't have a clue. It's just guesses. Guesses beautified by seeing it repeated often. Uh, for these four, there were some basic studies. There's two main ways that you can identify how many people have died. One is to have an enumerated list of people like you would have if you were had soldiers. And that's why we know how many soldiers died for the last 300 years in nation states, because somebody was paying them. Their name was on a list, and it got crossed out. So there was a way to count it up. The other is to do epidemiologic studies, which is to say to go to the field, take a sample, and generalize from that sample to a larger population, which has some weaknesses and problems. But if you don't have a list of all the people, it's the way you can get an impression. And these are the countries that had those sources of data so that they aren't guesses. You could say, at worst, they're guesstimations. They're based on some field-based data. This is interesting, but I'm going to skip it. Since I'm talking, I can do that. This one, too. I actually want to get quickly more into Iraq for you, um, because that's where I've been working a lot of time in the last eight years. Uh, but before I do, I sort of alluded to this slide. If we take our bad data about how many people died as combatants, and if we take our even much worse data of how many people died not due to famine or infectious disease, but as a result of combat indirectly in wars in recent years, roughly speaking, there's something like 10 or 15 civilian, 10 or 15 non-combatant deaths for every combatant death. We don't know what it had been like in history, but we know that in the modern era of the last 300 years, it hadn't been anywhere near as high. It was roughly speaking one to one. Uh, we actually had pretty clean wars in the modern era. 
where soldiers, generally speaking, try to avoid having the impacts of their conflicts on their own civilians, and often, usually, combat was was engaged in a, physically apart from where non-combatants were, so that those effects could be isolated. Here you have conflicts where it occurs right where people live, and very often uh, non-combatants are put directly in harm's way as a tool of, of conflict. And even more important, because these conflicts are occurring in the poorest countries in the world, infrastructure is very weak to start with. And if you take off that very thin veneer of uh, goods and services which keep people going, which is to say, um, maybe it's a dirty water system, but you got water, you got wells, and maybe it's not that dirty. Anyhow, if we have enough water, even dirty water is a whole lot better than not. Immunization systems, some system of providing some monitoring of nutritional status of kids so you can identify which kids need it. If you take those couple things away, bed nets, then suddenly the deaths among civilian populations rise enormously. Um, and the place where this has most been the case, the place where there have been more non-combatants who've died in wars, in, 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 in any of the wars, is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is the reason. Essentially, it's malaria and diarrhea that when people have had to rush into the bush, suddenly they start dying like flies. Um, this is a street, street scene in Baghdad, which uh, means a lot to me for a couple reasons. Um, I used to walk around Baghdad everywhere, and now I can't walk out on the street for one minute. Uh, I'm usually disguised and usually behind a bulletproof glass, and usually with a couple Iraqis with me if I go anywhere. And it's just so amazing. I could have never imagined, because I would spend hours and hours walking around. Um, and you didn't even think that there was going to be a problem. But what I came upon here, this was 96. Um, the guy turned around, because there's no foreigners around, and he thought it was cute and strange, and he didn't know how he how he felt about a foreigner being here. What people were doing was auctioning used clothes. Uh, they had been under sanctions for six years. People change what they do a lot when they are suddenly impoverished. And there are lots of strategies for getting by when that happens. Uh, in Iraqi society, people never used to have used clothes. There was no place like the Salvation Army. Uh, but uh, uh, magazines, books, Essentially, none came into the country after 1990. So everybody brought out their old magazines and resold them. And if there was any magazine anywhere you hadn't read, you'd get to read it eventually. Um, it was the recycling of goods. So he knows all this is going on. This is an expression of their sudden impoverishment. Um, and he's sort of embarrassed that a foreigner saw it, but he also thought it was kind of like funny that it was happening. Um, so again, among all the things going on here, what wasn't going on at all was any threatening behavior or any, any concern for myself about dealing with these people. Uh, it's funny sometimes how much a country can change. What we had after the invasion in 2003 was a two or threefold rise in the number of civilian deaths that were registered in the morgue in Baghdad. Uh, the red tip is vehicular deaths. So those went up, um, but most of them are, related, are violent deaths. We don't know how many civilians have died in Iraq. We, we also don't know how many insurgents have died in Iraq. We have some wild guesses from the military about insurgents. And we have several sources of data on civilian deaths. And I've been involved in some of that, which is what I want to talk about now. What I put here is two different sources of data. One is the number of coalition troops that died. And that's the, the scale on the right. And, and that's uh, uh, this dark thing. This point is when President Bush got on the aircraft carrier uh, with the banner, job well done. Was that it? Mission accomplished. Uh, this is the first war in US history or in recorded history of countries 
where there were more deaths to occur after major combat ended than before major combat. That was true actually eight months into the war. And it's all the more true now. It's an expression of the strange nature of uh, the contest of power in Iraq that actually there, there was good reason to say that the epidemic of deaths, the rapid increase in deaths among our troops came to an end and there wasn't the anticipation of the insurgency in the way it was going to go. This violet scale, which is, uh, you'll note, five times higher than the scale on the other side, is reported, reported and confirmed civilian deaths. Essentially, civilian deaths that were recorded through the hospital-based system. People who came into emergency rooms and got recorded as a death. Um, so you see that the trends have, have been fairly similar with a large rise in the period of major combat and a, uh, a, a rapidly rising and dropping rate, a somewhat irregular rate with a tendency to increase. And it's at a scale that's five time high, times higher. But the important thing about this is that this, this is what I would call a hypothesis generating uh, group of data because we know that the, uh, the number of recorded deaths is only a fraction of total deaths to civilians. When you want to reduce deaths, you want to know, roughly speaking, how many, and most importantly, you want to know what are the causes of death, which we can't get from this very incomplete and very partial system. The system among US, uh, uh, I should say, among coalition troops is very good. We, we know better than in any conflict in the past how many and due to what causes. Um, their deaths occur. But this suggests that there was important things to learn about civilian deaths. Mm, I'm going to skip some things. We can always come back if there's time. Um, I went back and reviewed the records from occupations, post-war occupations, both among civilians and among occupation troops where the United States has been the occupying power. I should say where the United States or the UN has been the occupying power. Essentially, until you get to Afghanistan and Iraq, there were no deaths after occupations began. Uh, with Afghanistan, there was a rising tender which has gone much higher, both among civilians and combatants. Um, it's an entirely different world than if you think about um, the post-World War II occupations by Allied soldiers of Japan and Germany. Essentially, there was no risk of death to soldiers when they were there in the occupation. And now we have more deaths in the occupation than in the period of major combat. Um, it's a testimony to how much the world or the nature of conflict has changed. Okay, say you want to know how many civilians in Iraq are dying. And it's not a very nice place to hang around, and you can't just knock on doors and ask people. And there is some pieces of systems that record some deaths. But you'd like to know the magnitude of mortality overall and the major causes of death, and the changes in cause from before the invasion to the period post-invasion. How would you try to go about how might you go about learning about this? You in the behavioral sciences. <laughs> how, how could you get a clue of how many civilians might have died? I knew you'd come up with it. Media. Actually, yes. Um, there really are three systems, and I described one, which is to say the hospital recording system. Um, there are media reports because although it's tremendously constrained for media people to move around, uh, which is very dramatic right now with the Christian Science Monitor journalist who's been taken hostage, um, there are a lot of journalists and a bunch of 
um, events, violent events, do get recorded in one press or the other. A group of political scientists got together and set up a system to comb all media reports uh, to identify unique events and discount those that are already ascribed elsewhere and accumulate that, those data. That's the data that I showed you in Violet from before. It's called the Iraqi Body Count Project. They began with Afghanistan. Uh, and the reason they began is that the U.S. Uh, military had previously in conflicts uh, reported on estimated deaths to civilians and combatants from other sides. And with the invasion of Afghanistan, they changed their policy to not, as they say, we don't any longer do body counts. Um, so political scientists picked up the mantle and through this very imperfect mechanism, uh, found a way to get some impression of what's going on. And they've been doing this very successfully. So successfully that eventually when President Bush responded to the question of how many civilians do you think have died in Iraq, he used their data. Um, this, is, this is, again, sort of a lesson to you. Uh, if, if there's no data, your data is the one they'll use. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Some data is better than no data. Now, if you're being responsible as a scientist, you collect bad data and you figure out how good or bad it is and you give people some impression of where the weaknesses are along with the number. But in the real world, everybody will forget about that and they'll just remember the number. That's what happens. So, and that's what happened to President Bush. He used it, the, the current amount because they have a range where they're not sure of how many people die. Um, Iraqi body count was using at that time, this is about a month ago, uh, 28 to 32,000 deaths. Um, so he said, well, maybe around 30,000. Um, that is a really interesting political science effort, which provides at least some impression of trends in some areas if you know that the reporting is better in those areas. And that's a lot better than nothing. The other way you would do it is a survey. And uh, myself and a colleague from Johns Hopkins, along with Iraqis from uh, two of the universities that I've worked with in Iraq over the years, got together and we did a household survey uh, in 2004. Late 2004, no, uh, 2005. It was, it was now about s 17 months ago, uh, where we took a stratified random sample and did cluster sample surveys throughout the country. If those terms don't mean anything to you, don't worry about it. You could look them up if you ever get into sur survey work. But this is a way to get a sample which is, roughly speaking, representative of a population where you don't have a list of all the people in the population to take a true sample. This is how we know how many deaths there were to civilians in Congo and in the other countries where we uh, know something about deaths to civilians. We used exactly the same methods. And the guy who was the head of it, who's from Hopkins, is the guy who helped to develop the methods and has been doing this for 20 years. Um, the governments of Britain and the United States never referred to Iraqi Body Count Project. When asked about it, they said, you can't trust it until our data came out. Um, and our data showed so many more deaths than they had accumulated through press reports that all of a sudden the British and American governments uh, uh, liked the Iraqi Body Count Project. Literally, the next day, the Foreign Minister of Britain started using the term Iraqi Body Count Project um, in every press conference because he was asked about our data in every press conference. So there's there's some lessons for you there. Um, and I'll, I'll just draw one or two of them. First of all, we did do it the right way. It doesn't necessarily mean you got the right results. It depends how you carry it out. And you can never relax when you're doing survey work, particularly among politically charged topics where people can answer questions in different fashions. Um, but there's nothing like entering a field where there's no data and having strong methods and having a track record of doing it well. Um, co U.S. Congress liked us when we did this in Congo and used that data and there was no controversy. But, of course, this is a politically charged situation and so suddenly there was an enormous amount of controversy. And I'm still asking the people from Iraqi Body Count Project to send me 
uh, uh, money every time their name is used because we put them on the map. Uh, they got like 10 times more hits from the day that our stuff got published. What we found is that in the 16 month period from invasion up until the time of the survey, taking the pre-invasion population of the houses that we sampled, which were about a thousand houses spread throughout the country, we identified everybody who lived in the house before the invasion and then identified how many of them had died and tried to identify what they had died of if they had died in the intervening 17 months. And then we took that data and made a generalization to the national population. What we came up with was a figure about 100,000 excess deaths. If any of you have heard this 100,000 deaths in Iraq, you can thank me for that. Um, of course, that's not what we said, but that's how things work out when somebody says to somebody. There were, our central estimate was 98,000 excess deaths among the residential civilian population do, do all, from all causes. Um, now I'm going to get into that a little bit for you. Mm, I got other good stuff, but if we don't have, if we got time, we'll go back. Here are those data. What you see in the different promises that came up in our sample is the mortality rate in the year before the invasion and the year after the invasion. That's not exactly right, but that's approximately what we're doing here. And what you see is that the mortality rate went up a great deal in most of the country except for the North, which wasn't experiencing uh, and essentially hasn't experienced conflict within the Northern region. Conflict is along the borders of the Northern region. And that the biggest change occurred in Western Iraq because the community of Fallujah came up in our sample, which is, was an area of major conflict. We didn't include the data from Fallujah because it was a statistical outlier and it would have made the numbers just enormous and crazy. So what we said is around 100,000 deaths as a conservative estimate and possibly many more if high conflict communities were to be included in the estimate. But there's a small number of high conflict communities and we only happen to have one of them so that we couldn't make a reasonable assumption based on that. Um, this was published in the Lancet Medical Journal just before the election last year. And it's just amazing how many articles started to appear four hours after the electronic public publication of this thing in the Lancet um, saying, no, it's not true. These guys are lying. Couldn't possibly be. They don't know anything about statistics. Uh, uh, and a whole lot of other arguments that you couldn't even come up with if you were, you were yourself. And th the amazing thing is it still hasn't let up. This was published uh, 16 months ago, and every week I still see a new article saying it couldn't possibly be 100,000 days. Or some people saying it is, or you who say they don't know anything about statistics don't know anything about statistics. Um, and all we do when we respond to these at this point, because we used to say, uh, actually, you say that we just took the convening people, but no, if you read the article, you'll see it's a representative sample of the country, put all the provinces in a bag and came up with the numbers. We used to make specific responses when they would say silly things. Um, but now all we do is say, why are you still trying to diss this study from 16 months ago instead of trying to come up with a way to figure out how many people have died that you might think would be better. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure why people want to still talk about it. Uh, whatever, however accurate or accurate it was, it's now, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're a year and, a, and several changes in the nature of the conflict past that, so whatever patterns it represented aren't so important. But what's most useful, th this is the data from the Iraqi body count, which these are absolute numbers. I just found this yesterday. What I want to do is turn it to rates, and I bet you're going to find that it's fairly close to what we did, but at a much lower level, um, 30,000 compared to what would be approximately 100,000 if you projected our numbers forward. To me, more important than the number, and I never focused on the number because 
Uh, as Stalin said, one death is a tragedy and a million deaths is a statistic. Um, from the point of view of somebody in public health, what's important is what were the causes of death. It's true that violence was the biggest increase by far in causes of death. And part of the reason that this became a very politically charged study is that when there was a violent death, we did further uh, survey questions with the family to understand the context of death. And the majority of those deaths occurred through air attacks. And only one of the forces involved in the conflict has the ability to engage in air attacks, which is to say, in this period of conflict, from the, from the first 16, 17 months from the invasion forward, the majority of civilian deaths occurred due to air power from the Allied forces. Uh, that, that was an obvious political reason why there was a good deal of sensitivity to this, and notably not a sensitivity among military forces who asked us to come down and explain it and were very interested in our data. Um, this is part of their responsibility under the international rules of warfare, and the military is concerned with the preservation of its reputation and its rules of conduct, uh, and has a keen interest, at least some parts of it, in avoiding civilian casualties. Um, it, but it was remarkable that, that whether they agreed or didn't agree, there wasn't a defensiveness among military groups. They were interested to understand what we had done and what it meant. They weren't like, like these guys, four hours after it was published, there were these articles all over the place by these supposed expert statisticians, and they were nothing but pot shots, you know, like, I know this guy doesn't blow his nose, you know, silly things just to make us look stupid or make us look, don't trust him. Um, to me, it's also very relevant, of course, the number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease. In virtually every country in the world today, except for two or three of the poorest, the number one cause of death is cardiovascular disease. Uh, what's important between developed and developing countries is the proportion of deaths that are cardiovascular or otherwise. Uh, but it was somewhat remarkable to me that cardiovascular and infectious disease deaths went up in the post-war period because health services were better. But uh, what this means to me is that although hospitals had better equipment and more medicines, and health workers were actually getting paid because they didn't really get salaries before, so many of them were much more attentive and came to work more often, a lot of people with chronic disease or acute infectious disease weren't able to get to health services in the post-war period. The quality of medical services was better, access was poor because of uh, the instability in the environment. And also, this didn't surprise me at all. Because every country I've worked in where violence goes up, so-called deaths due to non-intentional injuries also goes up. A lot of the so-called non-intentional injuries are masked intentional injuries. And also instability causes a lot more unintentional injuries. Um, it won't surprise you that traffic used to be really well organized in Iraq. And since the invasion, it's kind of like anybody's up for grabs, the traffic signs, uh, lights don't work at all, and everybody drives crazy. And um, It's really dangerous to be in a traffic jam, and traffic jams all over the place. Any vehicle that I'm in usually jumps the median and runs down the other side. So you get people dying that way. Uh, this suggests to me, apart from military engagements, opportunities to modify the epidemiologic situation. And it certainly is a big challenge to uh, the interpretation of the rules of engagement in order to reduce uh, uh, harm to civilian populations. And this is what those numbers would look like. So this, what we've sometimes been accused of, of saying is that the U.S. military killed 100,000 people. It's actually 98,000 excess deaths, of which 57,000 were violent deaths, of which about 40,000 were based on coalition-based air attacks. So in the end, it's not all that different from the Iraqi Body Count Project data, if you look specifically at it. But it is different because this is a household survey, so you get a lot of things that don't end up um, in the press. Uh, I, I always talk too long, and I could talk a lot longer, but um, 
I think this might be a good place to stop and just start discussion and we can look into this stuff some more. Well, I should tell you, I should tell you two more things um, because it's in the title. Millennium Development Indicators, the Millennium Development Goals. Have you heard of those? Uh, if anybody has heard of them before, we have some outliers on this. Um, I, I'm not surprised. Oh, these are all the different sources on uh, deaths in Iraq. You don't really have to pay attention to this because you get you usually where there isn't data, where there's bad data, you get people making all kinds of crazy things. Um, don't think about this, but think about Millennium Development Goals. Actually, nobody should be able to graduate from higher education anywhere in the world today without knowing both the process and some of the content of the Millennium Development Goals. The states of the world through the United Nations over an eight-year period identified what they thought were the major, most important development goals for the world and identified what they thought were ambitious but realistically possible goals to achieve in a 15-year period starting the year 2000. So we're now a third of the way into the Millennium Development process and monitoring of it. Look it up on the web, learn, because if you go to any developing country, I think it's safe to say that at least a third of the people on the street know what the Millennium Development Goals are. This, the, the world that I live in, everybody looks at these things and thinks about them. It's we who are sort of outside of this realm, haven't had to, to get involved in it. But the U.S. is very involved in funding these activities and has been involved with the U.N. and apart in working toward these goals. They really are a, a, a superb base for uh, sensitive indicators that make a difference that we can monitor and that we can affect. Uh, conflict is not the biggest. I'm, I'm just running through. Well, okay. One of the millennium development indicators is infant mortality rates. It's our most sincere summary number, apart from gross domestic product, of how a country's doing. And it probably doesn't surprise you too much, but I won't go into this too much. The slide sort of says for itself. If you have a lot of conflict, your economy is being screwed up and the quality of life is being screwed up, and your potential for reducing mortality has gone down. It's actually, it works both ways. It's the countries with conflict are the countries with high mortality rates, and the countries that fail to improve their mortality rates are those countries that are in the midst of conflicts. So it's both the cause, apparently, or, or a, a, a causative factor, and it tends to make it worse as well. Um, these are the summary major development indicators for the MDGs, all of which there's uh, very specific uh, indicators under each of these with um, the quantitative indicators. And we've just now had our first interim report to see how we're doing. Conflict is no longer the major problem in the world. I've tried to sort of minimize it, for, put it in context to show you that it's not that important in all places in the world, but it certainly is important in places where it's happening. And the manifestations of conflict are not so much a question of soldiers who are dying, but of uh, effects in much larger civilian populations. It might be that for each combatant who dies, there are 10 to 15 civilians who die. And for each civilian who dies, there probably are 50 to 100 civilians who are displaced. So in those areas where these events are important, they have very significant ripple factors that impede the achievement of Millennium Development Goals. There's, of course, a lot of other things going on to either facilitate or make the Millennium Development Goals uh, unsuccessful. So. Although my work is conflict, it relates to MDGs, and anyhow, you need to know about MDGs. So I'm glad I could do that for you. And that's where, where I'll stop talking and let you start talking or ask questions or whatever. <laughs>
since we're taping this, um, if you have questions, either Anne or I will bring you the mic and we ask that you speak into the mic. And it doesn't just have to be questions if you have any thoughts. That's interesting for us too. I was thinking of something as you were talking about the different um, motivations behind wars a little bit earlier in, in your talk, and the phrase total war came up in my head because we'd been taught in school that the world wars were the first total wars in some sense. Everything was involved, the entire nation got behind it. And, and they also it struck me that, as you were saying, a lot of wars used to be about controlling people or changing the way nations were run or something like that. Does it seem now that a lot of these smaller conflicts, people, the civilians just kind of in the way of, of something else, of some thing, or like you said, investments or money? Uh, there's nobody who can answer this for sure, but I can share impressions. Um, for sure, when you have a nation state that wants to change the behavior of another nation state through organized violence of soldiery, uh, clearly that is a specific goal that has to do with leadership and policy. That's, that's kind of like the good old wars. Because uh, then you know when somebody has won and somebody has lost. A and there's an end to it. Um, a good war is a war that that you can reach a point where you say, now it's over. And this is, the Japanese fought like crazy. And then the day that they finished and said it was over, American troops rolled into their streets and not one of them was killed in the next seven years. Um, that essentially is a, is a, a good way to organize society. People, people do well under those conditions. And Japan did very well under those conditions. When, um, Identity doesn't have to do with the national policy, uh, which is often a symptom of countries where there's no opportunity for political representation or participation, or where that participation is very immature, so it's participation. Everybody wants to participate, but everybody wants, like, winner take all. You know, we want to participate if we win. If we don't win, then we'll start a war and take over another way. Um, that's sort of an, an early stage of reaching uh, a form of participation that many countries are in. Now, when those things happen, non-state actors, that's what it's called. Um, in other, another name for them is thugs. Um, are able to organize a military force to pursue their interest or will. Some of those goals are in their minds noble. Some of them have to do with religious or ethnic preservation or identity in, in an area where they've felt that they've been suppressed for a long time. Um, and sometimes it's not that at all, but it's those terms just in order to grab the gold or the diamonds or the timber, um, which in a globalized world is really easy to do. You can organize an army on the internet and you can uh, steal stuff at gunpoint uh, and then you can spirit it out of a country and sell it again through surreptitious means that, that the loss of control of borders uh, makes kind of into a joke. So there's the, the, the entrepreneurial opportunities for conflict have exploded with the end of the Cold War and the loss of national borders as important indicators or important controls for currency exchange or, or the movement of goods around the world. Um, every couple months, there's an insipid, idiotic war. Uh, like, somebody finds what? It was the son of Margaret Thatcher, who uh, got some venture capital country together and got a bunch of guys, Africans, onto a plane, and they were country hopping to go to another country to take it over to grab the treasury or something. You know, just a little just a little venture. Uh, and it's typical of these wars where finance is invisible and
Uh, there's a multinational group of investors that have no relation or interest in a country, but they hire a group of mercenaries and they rent a plane and uh, just, you know, it's the same thing you would do if you were going to set up a donut shop. Actually, it'd be harder to set up a donut shop because Dunkin' Donuts has the whole thing sewn up. But um, in this entrepreneurial activity where there isn't government, army, uh, um, customs, there's an attempt every couple months of some nature. Sometimes it really relates to grievances, and sometimes that's just window dressing that doesn't mean much of anything, just stirring up stuff. It's remarkable around the world in areas that are unstable that I've worked in, where people used to have identity issues. They were like minor issues. You know, like, okay, they don't treat us that well, but we've been living with them for 500 years, and uh, my father was one of them, and I don't know if I'm one of us or one of them, and we're all mixed and we're all in here together. And that could have gone in those countries into um, a multi-ethnic, multinational society like modern societies, but instead got whipped up in many places into uh, separate the border and change the script and the creation of identities today, which refer back to history, but it's not really very genuine. Uh, it's, it's invented identity. So a lot of it is of convenience, but it, it causes an enormous amount of suffering. Uh, and it's just this crazy situation where half a dozen countries I've worked in, where families are mixed through multiple generations. Somebody comes to your door with a gun and says, okay, you got to decide today if you're a Tutsi or a Hutu. Well, I'm actually both. Well, you can't be both, because if you're one of them, they'll shoot you, and if you're one of these, they'll shoot you. So you decide. Uh, you got It's an invented identity, um, often with the recreation of historical conflict, which really isn't very accurate or genuine, and certainly should have disappeared. Um, some ways, the more modern we get, the more primitive the, the opportunities to become more primitive develop. Um, you, you, uh, you, the first part of what you said was something else. I forgot what. Total war. You could say it's the triumph of capitalism. Like what you think doesn't really matter as long as we can make a buck, or somebody can make a buck. But total war really means something different than that. Um, total war was a term that developed in the early days of World War I, and it really didn't come to prominence until the World War II. Of, well, we used to have wars on battlefields. We still use the term, but we don't really do it anymore. In in the, in the period of organized nation states, the early period, literally, the two sides would say, OK, let's pick this field. It was almost like you know a pickup game. Uh, on Tuesday morning, you come from this side, we'll come from that side, and we'll be on this field, and we'll have a battle. So everybody else got a couple hills away to get out of the way. And projectiles 300 years ago didn't go more than 300 feet. Um, the other thing uh, that we're learning more and more about is when it was battlefields, when people looked in each other's eyes, a lot of people wouldn't shoot. They would shoot overhead their head or they wouldn't fire their guns. Those battles didn't kill that many people. When war has become much more an impersonal, distant activity, it's much easier to kill lots of people. Um, and this is just what happened with the, the use of air power. Uh, air power was not designed, I'm sure, in order to kill civilian Iraqis. That, that gets in the way of the political and military goal of stabilizing the country um, and making friends. The goal was to protect US troops. And so if troops are here and they're under threat, bomb a perimeter of 500 feet. Once upon a time, you couldn't get guys to do that. Because uh, they'd say, but, you know, there's a baby crying over there. I'm not going to bomb him. I don't care what you say. Uh, now, it's somebody who's like playing a video, video game. You know, they're in another country, actually. The people who are drawing in a lot of that fire are sitting in Qatar. And they're going through CENTCOM in Florida to decide to send the bomb in a 500 perimeter range around where our guys are at risk. Uh, that kind of impersonality, 
can kill a lot of people, you can actually kill a lot of people. And Total War describes um, a battle not against soldiers on another battlefield, but control of air, sea, and land in order to affect all populations, not only who are combatants, but support people. So uh, Total War actually got going in World War I um, as an economic embargo against Germany. And it was remarkably successful. There were more Germans who died after the end of World War I because of the embargo than died in World War I as troops because the country was cut off for six years and uh, people starved to death. Save the Children was born in order to break the embargo and bring food to Germans who starved to death. In Europe, everybody knows this. In the United States, it's, it's hardly known. It's really not part of our history. But that's when it was an expression of total war, which went really just into vengeance. To the idea of total war was either bomb or otherwise disable the industrial capacity of the country so they won't be able to successfully field troops to fight us. That means everybody is part of the target. And since that became possible with war through air and sea and economic means, um, since that time we've been in the era of total war, the genie's out of the bottle and you can't go back. The question is how one applies it and when one uses it. Um, our impression is that they have done a much better job in Iraq in this last year, but we don't have data to know whether the targeting has been much more careful, more specific. It really scares me, though, um, the incredible violent video games on TV. I don't care about violence as such, but I'm seeing the kids who are playing this blow them away and blood and guts all over. Two or three years later, they're sitting in the control room in Qatar, pressing the button and knocking down buildings around our troops in Iraq and causing a lot of deaths that we don't even count um, and making the ability to stabilize that country and our broader goals there much more difficult to achieve. It's, it's easy to train people into doing that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of like total war plus impersonality. The, the potential destructive power is really fantastic. It um, requires a tremendous amount of oversight and uh, reinforcement of the political and social goals in order to make sure that everybody's being very careful to avoid unnecessary harm. This is getting back to the ethics here. Um, and I have to say, um, I'm somewhat optimistic because the military people uh, there are a lot of lawyers in the U.S. military who are thinking just about targeting and being careful and how to make sure that we got the right target and this sort of thing. Um, political leaders may be much less careful. Political leaders have to worry about public and spin. Um, but military organizations have to think about their history, their goals, and whether their leaders are prosecuted for war crimes in the future. They, they, have, they have a different set of, um, of decision-making structure, and I would say a different set of ethics, which can be much better. It wasn't just an answer to your question, but you let me talk. <laughs> well, since we've just about run out of time, please join me in thanking Professor Gar. <laughs> Thank you.